public hearing for the presentation of the annual first grade. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Welcome, board members. Um, so today we uh, do our annual first rating, um, which is provided by the by the state. Um, before we get uh, too far, the question always comes up: Is that really should that be the 2018-19 rating, uh, which is correct? And we've all you know we've just finished the 2019-20 fiscal year, but it takes a year plus for everything to get worked through the system and for them to uh, process all that goes into it and then um, uh, submit our rating out to the district. So um, just a little bit of uh, background. The, the 2001 legislature um, put in place uh, what's called today the Financial Integrity Rating uh, System of Texas. Um, it's commonly known as, as FIRST. Uh, it it uh, requires each school district to, repair, uh, to prepare an annual financial accountability report. Uh, the primary goal of, of the first uh, report is, or the first system, is to achieve quality performance in the management of school districts' financial resources. Um, it's all the more significant due to the complexity of the accounting uh, that's associated with the Texas school finance system. Um, and as we can see, uh, just a few items on there. Um, the, the method of assigning uh, is a uniform financial rating to all schools. It's based on 14 various uh, measurements or indicators, as they're called. Uh, and of course, they're, they're designed so that they can give a, a, a fair uh, assessment across the state of all of the uh, school districts with uh, the, there's variances based on size of the school, uh, rural or urban, uh, just different things that, that uh, they Shelby, adjust to Shelby. match it up so that uh, so that they're comparable across all the, all the sizes and, and areas. Um, the ratings uh, rank from uh, A superior uh, down to F for substandard achievement. And this is a, a slide that shows the, um, the life cycle. Of the, uh, of the first system, which I talked a little bit about. So this uh, process for this one, uh, for this rating started uh, a little over a year ago on August of 2019. Uh, that's when we wrap up our year end. And of course, then it goes through um, the, the audit process. Once we complete our audit, we submit that to TEA in January of 2020. Uh, we also submit our PEMS data, uh, which is uh, another electronic version that goes to the state. Um, they review that, uh, compare the two, close the, the audit info uh, from February through about June of 20. Uh, TEA then assesses the ratings and the data quality until about July. And then in August uh, of 20, uh, the preliminary ratings were released. Uh, there's a 30-day appeal period for which a district could appeal. And then TEA releases the final ratings. This year was on October 30. And then uh, district has uh, up to 60 days to hold a public hearing to present and discuss their uh, their financial ratings. That's um, we're here today. Uh, see that date was the 14th. It's actually we're, we're a week early on that. So. And Brian asked these rating uh, for this year uh, is an A superior again. Um, the district has received that rating uh, each year since the inception of the first uh, rating system. And, and so. Uh, going on 18 years at this point. A little bit about the indicators. Um, there's there's uh, critical indicators which a no uh, are answered yes or no. A no answer to one of the critical indicators um, pretty much stops the process at that point um, and uh, the district fails. Um, there's uh, five that, that, that are based on fiscal responsibility, uh, two that are data uh, based on personnel, and then three that are based on the financial reporting indicators. And we'll go into those a little bit more in just a minute. Um, statewide, this is the all the ratings for all the districts across the state. You can see about uh, about 88 percent receive the superior rating. And then it also shows uh, the total enrollment of those districts, and so the percentage of that um, that applies to the total enrollment. And then this is the same slide basically, but it includes the charters. Uh, and the charters. Um, have a little bit different rating system. There's a few little changes on it, um, and their their ratings are, are just a just a little bit lower than the regular districts. Um, as you can see, the percentages in total are a little bit less. So 
of Ryan ISD's rating uh, detail. So the critical indicators are based on um, time of filing our annual uh, audit report. Uh, do we receive an unmodified or a clean opinion on the auditor's report? Uh, are we in compliance with all the uh, payment terms of all our debt? And then timely payments to uh, all of the uh, required, uh, like teacher, teacher Retirement System or TRS, the Texas Workforce Commission, uh, Internal Revenue Service, and any government agencies. So you have to be on time uh, and, and in compliance with all of those. Uh, any, of the, any fail on these indicators would be uh, an automatic fail for the district, and you don't, you don't go on any further. Um, the next group is the financial responsibility indicators, and they measure certain things like if your cash on hand and current investments um, is sufficient to cover your operating expenditures. Um, one that uh, there there is a scoring system. So I mentioned that we got an A. Um, there is also a scoring system. So 100 is the uh, total possible points. Um, the district received 96 out of 100. And the one that we miss points on is the one right there that's indicated current assets to current liabilities ratio. Um, and, and what that one does is uh, measures so your investments. Um, basically, the reduction in points there uh, is because we have our investments in a longer term investment. So they don't count in your current assets. Um, that's one that we've always, we've always felt. Um, I mean, we could, we could invest shorter term and, and get less return to get our extra points on the, on the um, rating, but we still feel like we you know, have sufficient uh, assets to cover our debts and, and there's uh, any of those long-term could be sold if they needed to be, if there was, if there was an emergency. And with our fund balance, um, we've never seen to, uh, it's never really been an issue. So um, we'd like to have those four points, but it just doesn't seem worth the trade off of losing the, the investment income. Uh, other ratios, long-term liabilities to assets, uh, total general fund revenues, uh, equal or exceed expenditures, or uh, cash on hand is sufficient to make 60 days if you get it. And the debt service coverage ratio uh, to meet the required debt services is another requirement, which we got all, all possible points on those. Uh, personnel, the couple that uh, they look at there, the district's administrative cost ratio uh, being equal to or less than the threshold. The state sets a threshold <clears throat> for each size of district as to what your um, ratio for administrative costs, uh, and we uh, we met that, so we received the full amount of points. And then the other deals with um, a significant decline in, in uh, student to staff ratio over a three-year period, which we have no issues with that. There was really no change for us. And then the financial competence uh, area. That's measuring all of our data that it compares. Uh, our PIN submissions uh, match our annual financial report within a certain range. Uh, external auditors uh, indicate that the financial report, the annual uh, report, is uh, free of any material non-compliance with regards to grants, contracts, and laws related to local and state and federal funds. Uh, we receive the maximum amount of points there. The other information that has to be included in the report uh, on an annual basis is the uh, superintendent's current contract, uh, reimbursements received by new board members uh, or the superintendent, and uh, any outside compensation or fees received by the superintendent, which there were not. That information is also received on our, on our full report, and the uh, full report will be posted on the uh, website as soon as uh, we present it today, so we will get that out there. Um, areas to continue to monitor, of course, investments. Um, you know, being the, the one that we lost points on, we'll continue to, to monitor that. Um, and also to, to look for opportunities to, to gain um, uh, additional revenue. Uh, the administrative cost ratio, that's, uh, we've received the maximum points on that, but that's always something that we uh, want to monitor uh, and watch that as it goes. Uh, our fund balance, maintaining a strong fund balance uh, and within policy limits. And then um, for next year, there, there are some changes in the, uh, in the indicators, uh, which we'll be bringing those uh, to show you uh, at a later time. But for the next uh, cycle, there's, there's some pretty significant um, changes that will uh, impact some districts. I've, I've looked at them from our standpoint. I don't feel like there's um, anything that, that uh, 
that would change our, our rating based on the changes, but uh, it's, it's all kind of geared towards moving us towards the A through F system, <coughs> trying to, I, I believe, trying to get things to more of a bell curve. So, you know, I yeah. don't, for however that, Good luck with that, however that works, but um, so that's, that is our report. Um, we're happy to, happy to report that we did receive the highest rating again this year, and we'll continue to strive for that. Questions or anything on that? I guess for many it is a public hearing, so any questions from the public? Well, with all the crazy stuff that's gone on and all the unknowns, we know again that we have a lot to be thankful for. And of course, we trust everything the um, department does, but this is just <coughs> um, evidence of the hard work you've done and thank you so much. Well, it, it's a district-wide rating and, and uh, I mean, I also have a great team, so, uh, but yes, it is a, it is a long, ongoing process and, and uh, you know, it, it helps when everyone pulls in the same direction. It, it's not getting any easier with all of the uh, uncertainty that we're dealing with right now, but, you know, we'll, we'll continue to push on and maintain. But it's nice for our community to know that throughout all the uncertainty everywhere else, this is one thing that's staying strong and solid here in Bryan. And Kevin's uh, transition from having Amy Draws in this position for so many years at the inception of the first rating, and then transferring over to Kevin, it's been a seamless, a seamless transition for him, his, he and his team taking over. So we appreciate you, Kevin, very much. Thank you. I'm glad it seems that way. <laughs> the, the part I find so interesting is that we lose four points on something that we don't think. Of. <laughs> so we're sticking to our guns on that. Rather than get a hundred to try to get the hundred, we said that's not the best thing for our district, and I appreciate that. Thank you. No additional questions, comments, or questions from the public. And we will uh, go ahead and adjourn public hearing. It's 1216. And at this time, I'll call this workshop of the Bryan Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this workshop has been duly called, and that notice this workshop has been posted in accordance with the Texas, Government Open, Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Chapter 551. Citizens may make comments about topics relevant to district business. Topics should be limited to three minutes. Comments concerning specific stu students or personnel will be heard in closed session. This time, do we have any public comments? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And then, uh, with no public comments, we'll go ahead and move into items for discussion and or action. Um, first up, we have the board goal update for culture and climate. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to <coughs> share a little bit about the uh, key performance indicators goal number two, which is culture and climate. And we appreciate the process. It was uh, it met a few times. It's been very helpful and insightful to meet with the board and the section of the board to kind of work through those goals and look at the data. And, uh, just department, uh, even in a different way, is exciting. And so um, I want to remind everybody of the, the vision for Brian ISD's Children First Always. The mission is uh, Brian ISD through innovation and choice and educational offerings will provide positive experiences that ensure high school graduation and post-secondary uh, success. And just for review, review the board goals, board goal one is academic, two, culture and climate, three, workforce, four, community engagement, and five, safety and security. And for our board goal indicator, uh, board goal two, our four committee members were Mark McCall, Julie Harlan, and Felisa Benford. And from the cabinet, we had uh, Dr. Yabara, <coughs> the two of us, Ms. Carabine, and Mr. LeBlanc. Just a reminder of what the culture and climate goal looks like is support a culture and climate that encourages a shared responsibility for a positive learning environments, which encourages positive regard for all people. 
And I, I think that living out the, the way that we've done that is just supporting this bill in particular, having a, a membership of the board that meets and talks. And so it was, uh, we'll share what that uh, group looked like when we talk about it. Okay, key performance indicator 2.1. The level of satisfaction of those who receive campus intervention coach, the CIC support, will increase from 74% from the fall survey in 2019 to 80% in the spring of 2021. And the CICs were uh, uh, created from the uh, task force, the Culture and Climate Task Force, and were implemented in the school year of 2018-2019. And they're slowly evolving in, in their support, but they do support first-year teachers to Brian, um, and second year teachers, they also support our struggling teachers as well. Any questions on indicator 2.1? On uh, performance indicator 2.2, the recidivism rate for discretionary places at DAP will decrease from 8.1% as measured in 2019-2020 to 6.1% in 2021 and we do anticipate for our debt to be just a little bit skewed due to COVID and um, we were out of school from March to May of last year and our numbers were low coming in this year. Uh, we do have our two transition specialists. They also uh, were created from the task force and the good thing about that was prior to the task force um, well, the task force created these two positions, transition specialists, who assist with any student returning from an alter, um, alternative campus to their uh, main campus, and they create a transition plan as well as a mon monitoring plan. And uh, these meetings include the parents, the campus leadership, and teachers, and they're really there to support the students who have issues and struggling in certain areas. They monitor their grades, their attendance, their behavior, and the monitoring takes uh, place from like over uh, three to four months, ensuring that the kid has what he or she needs in order to be successful. Any questions about indicator 2.2? Our next one deals with discipline, and this is going to start at the discipline and the attendance. This one's going to be, uh, we wrestled with it not only prior to the conversations leading in with the board, but also even in the conversations with the board, uh, how to measure this. And so what we decided to do was look at the previous three years, um, kind of take that as an average, and then uh, once we come out of this, hopefully we'll improve it by 0.5%. We put a ton of things in place already that are hoping to monitor as well as communicate with parents what's happening with the tenants. And um, as discussed in previous meetings, attendance is a, I mean, it's difficult at best. It's, it's a moving target, um, not only because of uh, exposures and also positive tests, but just simply students making the decision, parents making the decision to keep kids home. And so what we would hope to do is uh, increase that by 0.5%, going from a 95.26 to a 95.75, uh, roughly a 0.5% increase. Any questions on attendance? Okay, indicator 2.4. Uh, decrease the district-wide discretionary DAP placements by 8% compared to the prior three-year placements. And again, we're anticipating that our data will be skewed because of COVID. Any questions? Okay, indicator 2.5, decrease district-wide out-of-school place uh, suspensions to 8% compared to the prior three-year suspensions. Same thing, our data will be skewed because of COVID. And then the last one, uh, indicator 2.6, the percentage of students, parents, and employees who believe that the essential aid initiatives is having a positive impact in schools will increase from 58% to 75% for students, from 89 to 90% for parents, and from 80 to 85% for employees, as evidenced by the fall and spring surveys. 
Any questions? Can you go back one for one for me on this um, obstacle suspension to eight percent? What is it now? I don't have that information in front of me, but I can get it to you before you leave today. Okay. okay. Thank you. If I may, I think it's every. I think there might be a, a, a small typo there. That's by eight percent. Reduce it by eight percent. Your point to get. Oh yeah, by eight percent. It's still the same, and then we'll get the number. But yes, ma'am. It's still that. That is a significant. Yes. Decrease number. So I'd like to know what the number is. I mean, how many are It's lofty. Now. Be able to decrease it by yes, 10%. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we'll have an elementary uh, mathematics update. Progress monitor towards that third grade mathematics goal. 
So what you see on the screen before you right now are all of the ways that Mary and the, the curriculum and instruction team and the larger teaching and learning team monitor student progress starting in pre-K with the circles assessment and then through kinder, first and second grade. Mary and her instructional coaches do a tremendous job of creating some district-based concept checks that just check the skills as we go. And so what we look for are the students that are actually above grade level. House Bill 3 requires those goals to be set not at the approaches, but at the meets and masters level. And so that's mirroring kind of the star performance. So what Mary's team has done is taking the average of all of the students' performance on the concept checks to see what percent of our students are scoring actually above grade level on those indicators all along the way. And then naturally, Mary and the team always circle back and, and look at the standard the kid needs and fill in any gaps that may be present. Um, certainly we understand that we had loss of instruction due to school building closures in the spring of last year. And that's what Mary's going to talk to you more about in this presentation is all of the work of the team to, to mitigate that, those, that the lost instructional time and to really reinforce learning. But I wanted to bring it, I wanted to make sure we understood because next week when you have House Bill 3 in front of you again, this is all leading up to that. Okay. So thank you, Marva and Leslie. Um, and due to uh, COVID, we had to be forward thinkers. So we made a plan of attack. And some of the ways that we looked at that was through wrap-ups. We actually started the year off the first two to three weeks, depending on the grade level. We started the year off with um, actually wrapping up the school year prior to the, um, so that every student would get we would ensure that every student would get the items they missed, the, ne the necessary things. Another thing we did was we looked at our scope and sequence through curriculum writing and we said we adjusted our scope and sequence to reflect not only the wrap-ups, but also we uh, tried to include the previous year's standards as often as we could so it would provide a scaffolding effect for every student. And the last thing we did is we tried to make connections throughout our curriculum so we always embedded the prior learning, not only for students, but we offered the teachers a glance into that prior learning as well. So in K through math instruction, I think, um, you know, when asked to do a presentation and was asked that, what do you really feel are strong things that make mathematics and RNIC strong? So I think there are three pillars, three main pillars. <coughs> is that we have a problem-solving model that's not only K through 4, but it's K through 12 as well. We also have an instructional model that we adhere to, and we offer um, an instructional approach for all teachers, and that we continue our vision through these things. So I'm going to build on each one of those pillars a little bit more. The first one being the problem-solving model. This really, really um, allows our students to be better problem-solvers. If you notice in the picture of the little girl, She's actually using the problem-solving model without being prompted. So it actually gives them a way to work through problems, and it's systematic, so it gives not, regardless of the grade level you're in, there's continuity there. The instructional model, that's a gradual release uh, that we use, and it's basically called the I do, we do, you do. So what happens is a teacher starts off with some direct instruction to give some meaning to the how behind it and the why. And then she gradually releases that, so students work with the teacher, and then last, the student can do it independently. <clears throat> we also uh, have really, really worked, um, this is something I'm very proud of and that we continue to work on, is our small group instruction. Small group instruction, um, I did not learn that way, but what I, um, as a teacher, you know, in the last years that I taught, small group instruction really enables the teacher to identify every student's needs and individualize instruction more. So it offers um, such differentiation not only for students that might be of need, but also students who are very successful. So if you notice in the pictures that we have different uh, models here, and of course we're practicing the great um, social distancing and the great things that been offered to us by COVID, but let's take a moment and look at a live situation that we have in Brown ISD. I Thank you. Hey, have or force, Davion? 
actually uh, just a glimpse of what um, happens in small group instruction, and we have that in all grade levels. So in order to keep those pillars strong, we have supports in place for teachers. One of the main supports, and one that I think is uh, very critical to teachers, is we have our math instructional coaches. Every campus is supported by a math instructional coach. Um, some coaches are shared across two campuses, but every campus is supported by a math instructional coach. And because of our coaches, we, are, we provide teachers learning time not only during the school day, but after the school day as well. And we also, our coaches move into, in this, uh, they move into a more of a model when needed. They also work with students. So our coaches are very, very critical <coughs> in our teacher supports. We also, another um, way that we uphold the pillars is we build teacher content knowledge. I, um, some of the experiences that we have with teachers is some come out as language art specialists or reading specialists, and so math is something that we have to continually to build the content knowledge. So we offer different ways. Um, when we work with teachers, we actually study uh, the standards the state provides, and we dig in with teachers so they understand that. We also schedule time, a set-aside time, so they can really dig into the curriculum guides that we provide as part of our curriculum in Brown ISD. And we also help teachers with alignment. We provide an alignment document so they don't even have to question if something's aligned. So we provide them with uh, much content knowledge. We also, in Brown ISD, provide uh, teachers with content resources. And I'm super proud to say that our teachers have a wealth of resources at their fingertips. Um, our coaches help uh, to provide station ready, um, classroom ready stations, and they're ready um, through our meetings. Sometimes we even give them to them so they're ready the next day to use in the classrooms. We also, um, we also create our own accountability documents. So when your child is on a computer, or a student's on a computer using a program, we, we build in accountability logs so that they're not just clicking. So I do want to take a moment and uh, bring your attention to the second photo. It's actually a child using Imagine Math, and so I want to pause and just say thank you so much for helping that Imagine Math program to be accessible for our students. Uh, your support has strengthened that. We've been using it now about five years, and uh, we actually studied the data across Brown ISD, and it's very helpful to our students. So thank you all. We also provide content uh, ready reviews, such as focus folders that spiral concepts all throughout the year, and we provide thinking mats that are ready for teachers to use so st students can collaborate and make connections. We provide reteach resources, much like Barbara was talking about earlier, is um, you know, every time a child takes a quiz or a test, any assessment they may take, we're going to find some students might need a little extra push. So we actually provide um, a resource, and I'm super proud of the coaches, um, is they actually do some videos, some reteach videos, where a teacher, it enables her to continue with her small group instruction, and this is actually something a child can do independently. So uh, actually a coach is teaching the student, even says, pause and pick this up, please, now show me this, and it checks for the student. So it's such a great resource, um, and I'm super proud of that. Uh, there's a QR code. Um, I know in your free time you might want to go visit that and do a little math. <laughs> and like I said before, I would be remiss if I said parents aren't a big part of the job. Parents are such a huge part that when we hear things that are needed, we try to include those as well. So one of the things, uh, Brian and I we provide math homework for our students uh, district-wide. Um, so one of the things that came to our attention was that parents of course, the new math, you know, they may not know all the things about the new math. So what we've done is we've included a QR code on the homework. Every homework item that a child receives has a QR code with helpful tips. Uh, you might even be taken to a video or you might be taken to an anchor chart to help you work through the problems. So do you think that the kids teach their parents how to use the QR code? Totally, I think so. And I've come across so many conversations that sound like this. Well, I told my child he was going to do it this way no matter what. Because I don't know what they're doing. So I, I think, yes, it's a teachable moment. Yes. Great. Okay. 
So, um, I, I'm honored to be a part of uh, the math in Brian I actually can go home and say I love my job. So I'm continually thinking, um, not just myself, but my team and, and the girls that I work with, the uh, instructional coaches. So what we have upcoming is we want to keep our trends the same. We want to move upwards in math. Um, so we have a resource that's coming live. Um, we hope to put this forth in January. Um, it's been a vision for a couple years now, and so I'm super, super excited. Uh, that one gets maybe another super excited. Um, but um, it's a resource that will go out uh, live for parents, students, teachers will be able to use this. But actually, this resource has um, actually this resource has um, a way that you can actually see what games that you can play with your students that are math related and there are videos to see how to play the game that we've made uh, and there's how to's to do there's vocabulary there's actually some parent videos to help students uh, parents understand what their students are learning so example i didn't learn using a 10 frame but there's a parent video on how a parent can use a 10 frame and why you would use that why it's important so um, that's just a small glimpse into what's coming up for us in math and I, um, again, I want to thank you for your time. Um, a vision is that we don't want students just to learn math, but we want students to love math. I want students to leave Brian ISD and say, I'm ready to go to college. Not only am I ready, but I want to do something in the future and not avoid all the math classes in college. So, um, and my own child in particular as well. Um, so I had a parent say to me the other day before Thanksgiving break, she said, I was saying, my son asked me how many days that we were off. And she said, I told him it's uh, five school days plus two uh, weekends, which would be four weekend days. And she said, I, I looked at him, he looked at me strangely, but then he was thinking, and then he looked up at me and he said, Mom, that's a doubles plus one. So she said, oh, can you explain that to me? And he said, oh, Mom, it's just so much fun. So he went on to teach her what that meant. So I want to wrap up with a little video that we received during the COVID closures. We still ask children to turn in their work, and we gave them different ways to turn in. This student sent in a video, and I think you'll fall in love with her as much as you fall in love with a desire to learn math. So um, we got multiple videos, and it was hard to choose uh, because, uh, you know, just their excitement and enthusiasm. That's what we want is for students to want to do math and learn math as well. So thank you for your time. Do you have any questions for me? We have to keep track of kids like that. They need to become a teacher. <laughs> so <laughs> Carol, that's your, all that whole department. We need to, is she, how old is she? Uh, she's actually a first grade at camp. Okay, so we need to keep up with the, this year's first graders <laughs> to be our teachers of the future. Thank you again for your time and your attention. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, next I will move into business services.
And um, first up is consider approval for superintendent's recommendation for one-time supplement pay for employees. Thank you, Mr. McCall. <clears throat> so, uh, I've come before you today with a, a recommendation. I'll just give a little um, history and the thoughts as we've gone through this, this process. This goes back to um, budget prep and discussion um, as we start working on the budget in the, in the spring and, and summer uh, before, the, uh, before we get year end. And of course, our, our year end is August 31, so we're <clears throat> putting together the, um, all the budget and everything that goes into it. Um, this year, at the, uh, during that process, there was uh, discussion, of course, raises is always one thing that comes up um, to discuss at that time. And uh, the discussion uh, kind of centered around, um, you know, things were kind of undecided, uh, you know, what was going to happen with school as we went, you know, started out in a pandemic and all those kind of things. Um, we weren't sure about uh, what the, uh, would be coming with the legislature and the budget numbers and all that. So the discussion, uh, the topic was around zero to two percent. Is kind of what uh, what the discussion at that point was. At one point, we were talking one and a half percent, somewhere in those ranges. Um, as we got down to the final numbers and we and we uh, set the budget for the year, the uh, decision was, of course, the uh, teachers their their step that was actually about one point two percent, and then of course one percent across the board um, for everyone else. Uh, and there was discussion at that time at the, uh, you know, with the finance committee and, and different things. And we uh, talked about uh, at mid-year we'd evaluate things and just see what the uh, what the situation looked like, um, if things had cleared up on the on the uh, finance front, and and just how things were going with the um, uh, with the school being in session. Uh, you know, how were we functioning uh, during COVID and all of those kind of things. Um, and I, I, at this point, I guess, um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Whitbeck if, if she wants to add in, um, uh, kind of lay out where we, where we are on that standpoint as far as how school is going and, and those kind of things. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate Kevin's attention to detail because as we've prepared together to bring forth this recommendation to you, it's been a lot of trying to forecast and a very difficult time <coughs> to do that because of so many unknowns. Um, and I don't know, Kevin, if you talked about, if you may want to add in about many of the applications that we have out for reimbursement. Yes, ma'am. So um, at this point, right, we, and we've talked about these things, the ESSER funds and the, and the, uh, the Corona Relief funds and, and all of those. Project Connectivity was one that we did. We uh, purchased some computers. Uh, and those things are, uh, you know, reimbursements that uh, we could apply for. We've kept on top of those. Um, definitely uh, trying to, you know, secure all the all the additional funds we can for the district. Um, to date, we're we're looking at approximately about 3.6 million that we've submitted for various reimbursements: FEMA, um, TDM, uh, of course, part of the bulk purchase, uh, local matching option uh, with different, you know, the city, the county, uh, TEA, all of these all of these areas. Um, the eligible amount that uh, we've been uh, <coughs> that's been sent to us at this point is just a little under three million. Uh, of that amount, only about 362,000 has been approved right now. So there's about 2.5 million that's pending. Um, this, some of that, uh, there's uh, just a little under a million that we applied for right before Thanksgiving break, which came out, um, worked perfectly for us. It's uh, uh, part of the uh, connectivity uh, program reimbursement. Um, we. Uh, a couple of people on my staff, I would mention uh, Melissa Martin and Robin Trowbridge, stayed late on the, the Friday before Thanksgiving so that we could submit that. So we'd be one of the first ones um, in. And uh, Julie and I kind of kind of followed along with that and helped where we could. But but uh, so anyway, we submitted that, and that's uh, roughly a million dollars, and that exactly fits um, the criteria of what we did, where the board uh, also approved uh, using fund balance to uh, go out and purchase those computers knowing that this was a possibility and that it would probably come. So that's, that's one item that's out there. There is some additional ESSER uh, funding that still, as they, as they pay that money out and then they double back with what's left, there will be some additional allocations on that. 
Um, we're thinking that's roughly around 300,000, and I'm not uh, even told Dr. Whitbeck about that one yet. That just came on Friday. Um, and just some other things that, uh, that are out there that, that we'll continue to pursue are pending on that. Thank you for uh, delineating that, because what I think is an important piece is we're bringing forward a one-time supplemental payment in the form of a roughly a total cost of about a million dollars. You can, can give you the exact. We can't tell you that these, these funds that we've applied for are for sure. We can't tell you they're guaranteed, but we can tell you there's a lot more out there than what it would take to cover this. And we're hopeful, and especially with that last one on connectivity that came out from the commissioner, and I, and I want to take a moment to brag a little more than Kevin did, but we literally got that information that week before Thanksgiving. And because they stayed, we're in the early group to be considered. And so that's, again, the type of people we have on staff that are in Kevin's department and Julie's department to, to make sure that we're not going to snooze and lose <laughs> on any of that. And as you recall, that your expenditure last summer for uh, technology was you know, about $1.8 million out of fund balance. And that, you know, that was a huge commitment on your part and our part to serve the children. So, uh, but because of that, we feel confident that we can bring this forward to you in good faith. Uh, should everything go wrong, we get nothing. We know that our fund balance is healthy, um, and, but we certainly are hopeful that it will just be a switch, if that makes sense. Um, I would just want to add, uh, when our team has looked at this, uh, I would say that this is unprecedented, that uh, this is not something that we would intend to do and bring to you every year, mid-year. That's not the way we do business. We do business with our normal budget process. And, um, but that this, we're seeing that every employee in this district has had to work differently. They've had to go above and beyond. So for example, a bus driver. A bus driver doesn't just do their bus run. Now they disinfect between routes. Um, a nutrition worker is you know, individually wrapping, uh, you know, packaging, uh, food to be distributed to kids differently, uh, in, in also in terms of their disinfection that they're doing. The custodians, every Wednesday, we're, we're doing additional cleaning. We could go on, but of course, the teachers. The teachers, first and foremost, with online learning and face-to-face -face learning, have, have been in a world of which they've never known. And so we could take every group of people in our district and we could have a story. And so, but what, what is the main idea? The main idea is they've gone above and beyond and we want to be able to say to them, thank you and that we appreciate you and that they've made all the difference. That's why we've been open since August 20th with children. And we've had to close a class or two or you know, have a, have a team, not compete for a couple weeks. We've had those things, but we've kept the doors open and it's because of everyone's due diligence. So I think that's just something that that I, I feel like we as a team have looked at it and we feel comfortable bringing this forward to you and we feel like it's timely and that it's, um, it's a very important message. I don't see an agenda. Is this on, I mean, a, a, a motion? It's, it's, there. It, it's on there. Yeah. And then the I announce. must have the wrong view. <laughs> we've, we've switched to board book, this right. new board book, and I think everyone's struggling with <laughs> format. I mean, I'm sure that probably all in agreement <clears throat> we want to do for everyone as much as possible. I move approval of the superintendent's recommendation for a one-time supplemental payment for employees as presented. So. Okay, I have a motion um, by Ms. Waller, a second by uh, Ms. Benford. Is there any further discussion? Discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay, then at this point, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Did we say the amount? No. I didn't think we got to the amount. This oh, is, okay. This Sorry. is eight. No, it's all right. I, I, I think it, it, one of the reasons, and then I'll go ahead and just address, I mean, we were, we were anticipating this. We knew this was coming back in the summer when we set mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the teacher's uh, pay raise for it was. So we, uh, and, and I'm, you know, so this, this is not, a, uh, not an unexpected budget item, but if you, I'll go ahead and share the total cost. Sorry. Let's get it on the record. I'm so excited. Correct. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and we appreciate that, and, and I think I think it's a very good thing. But this would be 
Um, it would be $500 uh, for each exempt or non-hourly employee, which was going to include the salaried people, teachers, counselors, uh, librarians and nurses, administrative staff, uh, and professionals. And it would be $250 for each non-exempt hourly employee. Uh, this group would be the auxiliary, custodial, school nutrition, bus drivers, aides, and paraprofessional staff. And the, um, the total cost to this, uh, to the budget, is, is going to be roughly a, a million, just a little over a million. Also, I would like to explain, you know, as we looked at it, uh, when, when you all approved the 1% raise in the summer, and, and as Mr. Besaw mentioned, we looked at 1 to 1 1.5, we looked at 2, and then we thought, well, let's hold off and see what our enrollment is like and what's going to happen with COVID, and then we'll, we'll be able to have a better, better understanding. But when we look at a potential, for example, let's say we were just to recommend to you a half percent for every person. Well, that actually comes out less than what we're proposing in most cases, unless people are at the higher end of the salary structures. So especially for our paraprofessionals, our hourly workers, they, they definitely come out better with $250 than a half of a percent. So this is why we made it a lump sum, but we did make it in two categories because it is somewhat proportionate to a yearly salary. Does that make sense? So I wanted to just distinguish that and also for Ms. Chelsea and for the record that as to why um, we did it that way. Thank you all very much. Right. Thank you. And we'll keep you posted on all the uh, applications out for, <laughs> for money, right? Correct. Okay, next up we'll move into teaching and learning. Consider approval of updates to the grading guidelines for 2021. Thank you, Mr. Bissell. My pleasure. All kinds of new fun. Uh, so this afternoon, I'm bringing to you a request to update some of the language in our grading guidelines. Uh, one section pertains to students who transfer in without grades. We are seeing an uh, increase in students coming to us who haven't been prior uh, enrolled prior in another prior district and don't have grades to bring to us. And so we put a little bit more um, specificity to how that can transpire. So we help the, the student and then also make sure we give guidance to the counselor and the teacher in terms of how to proceed with those grades. So you'll see some clarifying language. Some of that was already in practice, um, but it was a really rare instance. But again, we're seeing more of that um, than previously. And then the big shift comes in an addendum that's at the end of the grading guidelines. And that's a request to consider the removal of final exams for the fall semester only. So the spring semester is still undetermined, but it is the administration's recommendation that just to make sure everyone's on a level playing field, um, those are at home, those are you know, on campus, all have the same advantages when taking a final exam. Rather, we'll put that into the six weeks average any particular grade and remove the 20% um, of your overall average coming from the final exam grade. Right, say, that, say that again. Certainly. Okay, so <laughs> most teachers will just add an assessment into the third six weeks for whatever they were going to do, and it is part of their third six weeks grade. Otherwise, for high school credit courses, the final exam, in most instance, instances, ends up being 20% of the overall average for the semester. So that would be excluded, and you would simply have the average of first, second, and third six weeks constituting the semester grade for a high school credit course. Does that make better sense? No problem. It Correct. does, unless the child is, depending on that final, to pull them up to passing. Yes, ma'am. Not that my children would do that. <laughs> but if a child, like Brian's children, <laughs> would slap all semester. They're moving in with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We do have other practices in place to help the students who perhaps struggled during the first six weeks. Okay. We have uh, programs for six weeks grade repair where students can recoup up to a 70% on the first six weeks and also second and third to help with those instances. Um, the, the feeling from campus administration and the district was uh, with ranking class and GPA calculations, making sure it was as fair as possible to all students um, and, and certainly there were struggles we even considered do we bring all students back for final exams and the struggle that might present for some families with medically fragile um, circumstances in their households okay thank you mm -hmm. is there a trend statewide 
for this? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we've seen many districts um, go ahead and make the announcement to um, exempt final exams for the fall semester only. And it is important to note certainly students who are performing well and have low numbers of absences already have the option to exempt a certain number of final exams in the grading guidelines. This just extends it to all final exams. Uh, but many districts are making that call and they, they're making it in November and December as they're trying to hold the line and, and make sure that they're on track for instruction and then based on the local health conditions, making the call. So do we have some early release dates right at the end of the semester like we used to? Yes, ma'am. So that's all going to stay in yes, place. It just won't be a two hour, will the schedules? Each campus high school principal based on how the board proceeds today will make a plan for that. But the, the days in terms of early release will remain. Because for parents, that's almost, you know, that's well, it's been not planned. as important as their child not having to take finals, but, you know, that the schedule's going to be the same for the planning. Yes, ma'am. Good. So, so word of this has leaked out. That's I, what I've I, heard. I, My son I, asked I've me about it. it. <laughs> uh, other Spoken areas. as a high school parent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And was fairly chastised as to why I did not share the this. I haven't heard about it yet. Um, but I have not heard anything negative, at least from the students that I'm involved with, that uh, would give me reason My to own be son um, in interrogated me about the same question. I said, Where, what are you talking about? <laughs> I've not heard that. Yeah. Statewide, uh, we're seeing a lot of information about an increase in failings. Yes, ma'am. Um, and, and so it, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, I, I am for not having the final exam, but I'm also not for having a huge number of Fs without that opportunity that you're saying we're offering to recover to get up to that 71. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are we seeing an increase in the number of our students that are currently failing? That is actually a paramount concern of, of all campus principals, not just high school, um, but that they are all closely watching. Certainly there were some struggles with students who were transitioning from online to on campus and then through various quarantine periods um, due to whoever they were exposed to. Um, we are seeing that that is a constant struggle for the campus faculty. Um, I won't say that it's resolved, but it's something that isn't actively worked on. In fact, this morning we were discussing it. How do we make sure every support is, is available to our students? And I believe Dr. Whitbeck probably described it best. You know, how do we make sure that we're equalizing their opportunities so that they can get the scores back to reflect their learning and their mastery? And if they have gaps, how do we fill those in and, and make sure that it's recorded so they retain credit and don't have to repeat courses in the future, especially for those four-year uh, grad plans? making sure they're staying on track for those. Um, so one of the ways in which we do that for some courses, not for every course, there are certainly specialized courses where this would be more challenging. We have six weeks grade repair that happens through an online system at Genuity that we allow for students to go in and basically it does a pre-assessment. What did you learn from the first six weeks? And then where are your gaps? And once you can show mastery of those gaps, we can do a grade replacement up to a 70% for you for that first six weeks average because you've shown mastery. Um, that also means the student has to stay on top of it and, and do that. They can do it outside of the school, they can do it after school, they can do it in the class when there's that's time. Online computers, so they have to have computer internet access. Yes, yeah. ma'am. So that's why a lot of it, what's nice about uh, the flexibility in our schedule right now with Block is that there are extended periods of time in every class. And so a teacher could allow for time for working on those repair classes during the class. I don't say that happens every single day, but certainly there's a short number of minutes no matter what you do because you're not seeing them every day. Uh, but it is one way in which um, teachers are able to do so. But it, it's, it's also working with the teacher um, to maybe recapture some of the, the stuff that was missed during the first six weeks and allow for potential grade changes when it's appropriate. Um, teachers have that discretion and many of them are working with our students. Uh, but certainly it's a struggle and it, it will be this full year. And, and I know, uh, Stein brought up a point, I, I know that all the high school students are, you know, have laptops, or slated to have laptops in the one-to-one -one program. Are all those in? They are in and deployed? Mm -hmm. So everybody should have the technology access now. 
it might be the internet still might be an issue afterwards but yes actually all middle school intermediate um, and high school yes we okay. were to report uh, every day though and see if anyone has changed their mind they need one now they didn't need one now um, so we're still doing that um, but with deployment and everything we've gotten them all out intermediates not sending them home yet they come by first period, pick up their computer that's in their bag, and tag with their name on it, and they carry it around. They're just get, they're, they were teaching the kids um, the week back of how to do that and how to bring it back and forth first before sending home. So. Great, thank you. I'm going to the updates for the guidelines for 2020 2021 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Harlan, a second by Ms. Finford. All in favor? Um, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, now I'll move us down into board local governance, uh, board go governance. I, actually, let's. Uh, I'm going to jump down to number two first, which is filling the um, <coughs> um, position um, that was um, single member district five. Uh, by the board policy, we have until about mid-February uh, to fill that position. And at this time, what I'd like to do is go ahead and recommend that, and, and I don't know if we necessarily, I know there's a motion on there, I don't know if we necessarily need a motion, but um, you know, the discussion would be to have a, um, to go ahead and open that up for applicants and um, put out an all call to anybody that would be interested in. We've worked through uh, a number of different people that have served on different boards, district boards, and, and have visited with them in there uh, for various reasons, health-related, non-health-related, um, <coughs> have been um, un unable to, to fill that position, to fill that term. So at this point, I would like to go ahead and if we're all um, uh, just provide you an update that we would like to go ahead and do an all call um, and have that out and then uh, have any discussions, questions about what that needs to look like. In, in the past, we've just asked for a resume um, and I believe Dr. Harlan mentioned that there was actually some questions prior to that application or? I don't, I, I that's been five years ago. Or okay. Years ago. Um, I remember doing something, but I, I think maybe to indicate interest, we sent something to Tiffany, just saying we were interested. And then for those who are interested, they got something that said, please provide us with the following info. And it may okay. have been a resume, how long you've lived in the district, um, why do you want to serve? So okay. pretty simple. And then the board decided um, of those, and I don't know if the board chose to interview all of us, but I believe there were three people interviewed, um, and then someone selected from that. When we put out the all call, we are, I'm sure, going to put a map of where District 5 is, because that's really, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it, it, is, yoga, it is online, but it's very, very hard. Right. It's, it is hard to read online. To read but, what streets they actually are. Yeah. We'll work um, on So we can make it very specific. And that should match City Council Place 5, correct? Yes. Yes, those should be yeah. the same. To, to some extent. Now, we do yeah. extend yeah. some yeah. out into College Station. So I didn't it's know if there. Place 5 was one that was just in the city limits. I know with mine, it's really, it's not an exact match because it goes beyond the city limits. Yeah, so does mine. Five goes down towards 47. Yeah. Well, so I, within the city, so within the city, it will match. Okay. Yeah. Um, And I think what we did more from Julie, and, and the one prior to Julie, is after we got the uh, application, we met at the board uh, and looked over all of them, and we decided the top three okay. that we wanted to uh, interview. Those were the ones that we granted the interview with the board. And then we made the selection after that as a board the following week. 
Well, I didn't know if I had made a first cut or if they were wrong. <laughs> I, I, re I remember us making a first cut, okay. so. Well, good to know there were people interested. Um. So the process of doing that would be spelled out. We have it somewhere so that people that are interested will know what to do if they're interested. And get that spelled out. So, yes. I mean, it, it'll be spelled out what to do. Basically, it'll be to... Um, yeah, Matthew will put together a packet to um, to distribute to the media and everybody else that are, that's, that's interested. And then to show interest, I would just contact Tiffany. And yeah, that's that's the easiest uh, easiest process. Okay. I move approval to solicit applications for both single member district five vacancy. Second. Okay, have a uh, motion by Mrs. Dwayne, a second by uh, Dr. Harland. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, motion carries. All right, um, I, I, the, the other item on um, board governance is I, underneath your red card. The uh, red card has nothing to do other than just separation. Um, but I gave, provided a lot of different information. Um, the first off is just kind of a committee survey. Um, if you um, would take a moment and complete that as far as just letting me know which committee you want to be on, um, what matches your strengths. Um, and then down in uh, the next underneath that is um, the white packet, which is the Bryan ISD School Board Operating Procedures. I, I want to point out, we're not going to vote on these right now, we're going to vote on them next, um, at the next meeting. So all this is information to take home, digest, read through. Um, the Board Operating Procedures have not been updated or addressed, the ones that are posted on the website since 2013. So anything that is has an orange bar out beside of it is, is updated, is um, new, with the exception of anything that we've adopted, like the new vision, the mission statements, and I, there, there are some new district core beliefs uh, that I'll have in the next, next copy. But um, for the most part, this is pretty similar to um, the 2013 <coughs> copy that's out there, um, other than just kind of, again, what's, what's noted there uh, with some additional information. Um, now, along with that is probably a bigger uh, decision, and that's with the purple sheet, is um, a couple of weeks ago, the state um, school board, the state board passed a new framework for school board development. And this was passed by the State Board of Education. Again, the framework that's included in the original uh, dates back to before 2013. So it dates back even further. This has been the first new framework that's come out. And within this new framework, um, Again, was passed in November. I, yeah, to me, it aligns a lot more with uh, exceptional governance and the Lone Star governance than the than the old framework um, did, and just kind of modernized it there. So I included this in your packet to review, and if we want to adopt the new framework next uh, next meeting as well, we can we can adopt the new framework if we want to wait, work through it a little bit more um, and, and adopt it at a later date. I think we're open there as well. So question, does the framework impact the board operating procedure? I mean, we it, have to redo or reorganize? We would just we would just replace the framework that's in there. The, the, the framework is listed in the board okay, operating it's procedure. Part of the operating right. Okay. So it's, it's a part of it. There probably are more impacts down into 
some of the content, but at this stage we just adopt a new framework, then work through the the rest of the, the rest I of did look at the framework when Doug Waterberger sent it to some of us. I don't know how who all sent it to just let us know it was coming. And I looked at it then. And as long as they approved what was proposed, it, it's fine. Yeah, it, and, it's, and they didn't make any revisions that I saw from that original. We got a, an email from TASB that had a lot of this mm -hmm. attached. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for printing all this out. Sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I, I tried consolidating a number of things that come up that are constantly questions about how do we do stuff. And the last two documents that I'm sharing with you, the, the blue is the uh, board calendar. And uh, technically a lot of this should probably go into the board operating procedures. Uh, but the first, um, first couple of pages really talk about how we develop the board calendar, the key dates, etc. But starting on page 6, 7, and the back of 8 is listing of the 21 Brian ISD board calendar as proposed. Um, and this is, the, the board calendar basically is a listing of official board governance events. So, uh, trust me, Dr. Davis, there are a lot more events that we get invited to, uh, including committees and, and everything, but these are the main governance events that would require a quorum is what we'd catch on there. The reason this is important to start kind of looking and getting comfortable with the board governance calendar, or the board calendar being these level events is because in Board Book Premier, we now have a calendar. And if we were to put everything that we invite to on that calendar, the calendar itself would become, you know, non-functional within Board Book. Now there is a Google calendar Right, you, know, you use Google Calendar and this Lee sends out the Google Inbox. That one um, you know, can have everything on it under the sun, but in Board, Board Book Premier, we'll be focused on these main, main calendar and main events. Okay, so Board Book Premier, wait, we don't need two different calendars. I mean, I don't need two different calendars. You, everything, everything on board book premiere will be on board on Google. It'll be on Google. So you, you just focus on Google. I think okay. the distinction is the reason it needs to be connected in board book premiere is because anything we take action on is connected to an agenda. So it, the calendar, sure. okay. it's all connected in premiere. So other events we attend are. Is, uh, is yeah. TEA or TASB or all the powers that be, are they connected to the? Uh, premier board book calendar. I don't think his big brother watching. So no. I, I, uh, I mean, our I, from what I can tell, and Julie can certainly jump in. From what I can tell, the problem, one of the issues that I have with board book premier calendar is that it doesn't integrate in. It doesn't pull the events in from group calendar. It is a okay, standalone see, calendar. I guess I didn't so. ask it, but that's what I was. Asking to ask. yeah. I just kind of took it for granted that they were connected, but no, unfortunately they're not. Now we look at others that will do that, but Board Book Premier will not do it. I know, they say it's on their road now. I know, catch up with us. <laughs> we need to be there, but no, they do not. So it is a standalone, you log in and it's, it's just there. And so whatever Tiffany goes in and adds, that's what gets put there. Oh my gosh, poor Tiffany. I know. Oh my gosh. Oh. And, and, and that's why, and that's one of the reasons why if, if we can improve this next week, then she can go in and set up Board Book Premier for the year and then only has to do like if there's a meeting cancellation or meeting change, but it's set. And then from then on, we would, you know, everything would go into the Google calendar. Yeah, but again, I think the distinction is that the what Google Premier is for is for our action stuff. Right. And the only place action is going to happen are at these 
scheduled meetings, so which is why it's very different. It functions differently than a Google Calendar. Right. For different purposes. So I'm not trying to make it more complicated. I promise. I'm, tr I'm trying no, to. I'm trying, trying to streamline some of this to get it get it in place. Um, which which is a great segue into the board training uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. Uh, because next week we will, or next at the night meeting, we will be getting trained on board with Premier. So you will get a little bit uh, deeper involved into board book Premier. But I did try to capture, again, there's a lot of extra information in here, but try to capture um, the different requirements for different board members. If you look over on page five, for everybody except for Dr. Davis, who is, is on page, should be on page six, but everybody else, that basically breaks out the training requirements. Um, where I want to point down to is child abuse prevention and evaluating and improving student outcomes. Those are every other year. So if you took evaluating and improving student outcomes in 2020, you did not need to take it in 21 vice versa so and I believe um, we can get everybody's training records so that you can lay them side by side and see which you've done what you have done this year versus next year and then the rest of that the, the next few pages um, we're still, from a school board standpoint, we're, we're in, um, we, we still relay, relay trainings back to tiers, although the tiers don't really, I don't think, mean as much as they used to. So the next couple of pages do kind of bring together those, that training table and the tiers. Um, so if you wanted to look at it by tier. Will we go over this next week? Will we go over okay. Okay, but on the back, I'll point out, and last but not least, but um, there is a 2021 board self-survey that we're going to ask, and I've also sent this by email. We should have got the email when we were, I, I pre-scheduled it, and I did not do it while we were talking, but there's an email to that link, and it's the, um, it's the TASB XG board self-survey. You'll get the individual results, but then it'll also aggregate Brian and two board results together as well. And um, it, it is a fun little survey that makes you think. It's about 20 minutes. That so, be as fun. do I? I I'm saying fun sarcastically. Fun. <laughs> yes, it's not real fun. Uh, if we can get it done. Um, yeah, later this week, by Friday, that would be great. And then give a thought, give some thoughts to um, kind of the, the Team of Eight training. If there's anything that particular that you would want to see in Team of Eight training this year. Um, <clears throat> anything as far from a continuing education committee focus type of training and then a um, in fact, a 30-minute like, quick training. So what quick topics that you think you might need some information about, more information about, uh, we get a list of those going as well. We might take 30 minutes out of a board meeting and do a, do a quick focus training on, on something or at the end of a board meeting. Board book? Did you have that scheduled? Board book is scheduled for next, next, next week. See, we're lucky we're not having to do all this virtual. Yes. So we can, we're, after all we heard today, all we Okay, so the main takeaways and, and um, is, yeah, there's content there to review, but the 21 committee survey, um, which is the yellow piece of paper, and then the back of the gold, the TASB survey. So this one's on paper. This one's on paper, okay. yeah. I actually did build it as a Google, but I figured it would be quicker and easier just to 
And give it to Tim? Yeah, I can give it to Tim. And Mark said bring us back next well, actually, I'd like to have the committee survey back before then. So if you don't fill it out today, I will send a, uh, uh, I'll send it electronically. I'll, I'll send you the link electronically. So, but if you could take a few minutes and fill it out, that would be, that would be great. That way we can establish the committees before next week. So how many of these are we supposed to want to be on? It says three. 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 <laughs> you're, you're supposed to want to be on all of them. Yeah, I was going to say, Fran, you're on Y'all uh, are finishing that up. I'm going to go ahead and move us into closed session. Way we can continue on the sheet. Okay. Now convene in closed session to discuss the following items as allowed by Texas Government Co Government Code Chapter 551.074 Personnel Matters.072 Real Estate. No voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussion in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in the open meeting. It is now 1:26.
board reconvened in open session at 1.47. No action was taken in closed session. I move approval of Mr. Paul Buckner as the director of construction and energy as presented. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Harlan and a second by Mrs. Wayne. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Yeah. Move to terminate the land purchase contract in the Reno Road property of Second. I have a motion by Ms. Benford, a second by Dr. Davis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, motion carries. And if there's no other for business, then we are adjourned. Okay, so Fran.